Hello, happy Friday. This is uh, Low Code Campfire, episode number 152 for June 21, 2024. Uh, we don't have any particular topics submitted in advance, so I'm calling it Open Lines Friday. Look forward to the discussion that's uh, going to happen. I am Dale Warner, head of support for Plantonat, joined capably by Patrick Anderson, technical success manager for Plantonat, and uh, looking forward to getting into it with you. This is a uh, event that we do every Friday, 10 a.m. Central Time. It's open to everyone, and we uh, get together, talk about Plant and App, and our low coding experiences and challenges and techniques. Um, <laughs> so, bring something to show. Um, if you have ideas and suggestions, we welcome them. All of these are recorded, put out on YouTube. So, YouTube.com/slash Plant and App will get you all uh, 150 one episodes previously done just subscribe hit the alarm bell you'll get notified when we uh, post new episodes which usually happen these happen in the afternoon after they are uh, recorded we'll do this agenda we always say hello and uh, go around <laughs> the fire with first call but then where we go after that it's uh, just according to the, uh, the 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 whim and will of the people after an hour, we'll go into Afterglow, where we turn off the recording, uh, enjoy each other for a few more minutes, do engage with us, jump in, show and tell. You can use the chat window or just just uh, jump into the conversation. If you do have noise going on behind you, we ask you to mute. Uh, you can submit questions and topics in advance with this QR code. I don't know if anybody's uh, tried this QR code lately because nobody submits anything in advance. A programming note, very important. I won't be here on July 5, neither will Patrick, so it's going to be kind of quiet. So uh, no episode for July 5. And hello, everyone. Good morning. Hello. Good morning, Dale. Happy hello. Friday. Morning, Dale. Happy Friday, indeed. Hello. Uh, so, did anybody come with a first call? Something that we just need to focus on right away. Hi, Dale. Jerry here. Uh, not really so much a first call. I just have a quick question that I think we could push through real quick and be out of the way for some real important stuff. Okay. Uh, as I'm going through my uh, migration process um, and reading the notes on version 1.26, it appears to me that API endpoint has gone through some significant upgrades and changes and philosophies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 100% true. Am, am, am I reading it right that all of my endpoints are going to be renamed and any software that I have out there is going to have to be rewritten or notified of these changes? My, my uh -huh. existing endpoints are going to become obsolete at 1.26? So the answer is maybe. Um, okay. Long, long ago, we had one format of um, the naming the endpoint. Um, it, it was a long format. Um, in between then and now, we had we we had two different ways you could access the endpoint. It was called. It's now slash API slash and the endpoint name. And so lots of people have only ever had only ever used that because that's the one, I mean, it's the, it's a simpler one, but we offered both. We're taking away the old one. So if you're not using the slash API slash endpoint, um, but rather the other one, and I can find out what it is. Patrick is looking it up right now as I'm talking. <laughs> um, that, that older one, is being deprecated. It's, it, I mean, not only deprecated, it's being removed. So that would represent a breaking change. Okay. So, uh, and, and I'm not on that screen, but I remember exactly what you're talking about, that the old one was a a longer endpoint. And then the, the secondary one, which came along somewhere in life, might have been called a friendly endpoint or a friendly URL yes. or yep. something that implied it's a little bit more gentle than the other one for some reason. And that's what I have always used is the second of the two. Yes. The, so the that friendly, gentle, and, you know, Patrick, do you already have it or shall I? Find yeah, it's a uh, desktop modules slash DNN sharp slash DNN API endpoint slash API dot ASHX question mark not method equals. <laughs> no, not very friendly at all. So all that, the, all that 
that I just blurted out is replaced with slash API slash, and then your endpoint name. So to clarify what you were saying, Jerry, that um, the endpoint name is the same. It's just the path to the endpoint that the, the old path to the endpoint has been removed. And now we have just the, just, so we already offered the newer um, path and now we have only the newer path, which is just slash API slash endpoint name. Okay. I think under first impression, I am really good to go. Um, my, my personal situation is, is a mobile app that we have written that calls about a hundred APIs. And um, that was just going to be something we needed to kind of be ready for. But I, I know historically, I'm not sure that I've ever used the old long version. And if I did, it was many years ago. So uh, Dale, Patrick, if I hear you right, I think I'm good. Uh, I think you are too. Let's um, going to see if I can. Yeah, here we go. So, I'm looking at an older version of plant app. So this is version 121. Uh, the endpoint for this is called activity type. And so we've got it here. This is what Patrick was saying, the path, very short slash API. The legacy endpoint is what's going away. So this big long blurb. So if this is all you've ever used and, and all, that's no problem. Um, you know, with this is this has certainly caused us some internal problems where um, we've because at one point this was the only thing that was available. We have some older systems that that used this longer legacy endpoint, and uh, so we've been hunting them down and and having to uh, to change them, which was why. Um, just as a reminder, anybody who's dealing with this uh, in our campfire website. Uh, this is why we uh, published this or, or posted a link to this global search and replace tool. You can search your database and find the instances where you used that old uh, legacy endpoint and then um, go and either fix them one by one or fix them in the database. But if you told other people about them, uh, about if other people are using your endpoints, um, that, that can be a problem you you've got to communicate with them that this is no longer working well and also if they um if they get an error and they pay attention to it they will see um uh, a friendly message that tells them that this is the path they should use so the, so, the very error good the error response from the api says that the that the path is not good anymore you should use slash api slash So while we just um, a quick look at, um, I mean, you mentioned it changed a, a lot, and it did. One of the change, one of the changes was it's no longer module based; it's a library, and so it's uh, a, you, you don't see a, a a DNN API endpoint module, and uh, in the past that was a way of dividing up. Um, you could have different APIs assigned to different modules. And it was no longer, it's all in one spot in this API. It's all managed from here. And um, I will just mention, again, this is a 126 system. Just mentioned one of the big pluses is that now you have control over the, uh, the, the endpoint URL. It always has to begin with slash API, but you can, you can control it and, and add other content like, um, uh, version one, so you could have different versions of the same API and publish newer versions for for external use, for example. Or yeah, so lots of good things going on with DNN and API endpoints, but that that was all right. Casualty. That's very good. So I went back and I looked in in our system and um, back around version one point seven, one point eight, and there it was called friendly endpoint, I believe, and that's what we have have used from day one. So uh, as we migrate through the process and eventually on to 126, or not eventually, soon, um, I would assume that part where you were just saying you could control the endpoint URL, my old school friendly 
endpoint URLs either might be populated in that box we're looking at now, or at least it'll work. And that's, yeah, that brings great comfort to us. Yes, we've, from an upwards compatibility standpoint, um, they're going to remain um, automatically, the endpoint URL is going to remain the same as the name of the UR, of the endpoint. But at, uh, so upgrade, you'll be fine. From okay. a, from 126 on, you'll be able to change that if you want it to be different from the name. So this this becomes more like a a uh, reference or how you how, uh, how you you find the API and the APIs. This is the the URL. Typically, they're the same, but you can make them different. All right, and uh, if I may, um, I don't want to turn this into a challenge. I just want to throw this at you. And if, if you've seen this before. The quick answer: I am at on uh, on two different of my test systems. I'm at 1.25.241, trying to go to 1.26. I can't proceed further because 1.26 says I can't install because you don't have all your hotfixes installed on 1.25. I have two hotfixes; they're duplicates of the scheduler. And the version on it ends in a dot four four, I believe. And but either way, can't get those to install. And that version number is smaller than the version that is actually installed. And I had, the, I think you and I may have actually talked about this in the past, where it is indeed a library and it is indeed set up right and and all good. But my hot fix program so, is still showing that it's there, which is really so. And one of the things that Patrick. Dale, both of you have taught me is sometimes our update pages are not uh, properly updated, if that's the right word. And so I've deleted those pages and rebuilt that run the SQL query and cleaned up everything and then allowed to rebuild its pages. But on this particular instance, I can't get my hot fixes in 1.25 to empty. So I can go on to 1.26. Have we seen that one yet? So you've replaced the page. I did. Um, and uh, the other and we'll be happy to do it again in further testing. I don't want to burn up our, our TV time yeah. today on it. But <laughs> um, the anomaly, Patrick, is the version that's in my hotfixes is an earlier version than what we actually have installed. In yeah, the, no, uh, I, I, yeah, and it's not, it's not an unusual thing. Um, we've seen it. It's just that usually replacing the updates page um, will fix it. Uh, okay, I'll but, do that again just to make sure. Uh, um, and if it doesn't, if you wouldn't mind, open a ticket. We'll make sure. That yeah, absolutely. Yeah, happens. absolutely. We don't need to burn this time for that. I, I think okay. that. Uh, I mean, it is an anomaly where uh, you you should be able to um, install, and uh, we can certainly provide a way around this safeguard. That it's a new safeguard where we're trying to make sure everybody installs all the hotfixes before jumping to the next version, and. Um, but if if you're there and the safeguard is the problem, we'll we'll uh, we'll give you the key to the gate. All right, guys, thank you so much. Uh, today's an anniversary of mine, and I've got to hop off shortly and be gone for the rest of the day. But uh, uh, thanks to everyone, and you know I'm here for you 24 seven. If if I can offer any assistance to anyone, just hit me up. Thanks, Dale. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Jerry. Thank Absolutely. Hey, I I forgot one. Programming note, I, uh, not a programming note, a, a, uh, a, a announcement. I, I, I searched and found a setting on my microphone that was not set to 100%. Is my <laughs> microphone any better today? You're doing fine. Okay. I think it sounded very clear. Yes, it's yeah, better. It's, it's better. Thank you. Much better. <laughs> well, so uh, then it turns out to be um, PebCAC, right? Problem exists between keyboard and chair. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> All right. What else? First call. Well, I, I have two questions. Uh, one related to a 126 follow on that since Jerry brought that up, which was I saw in the notes it talks about um, linked forms being depreciated in the future. Is that. Um, is that is there a plan for something equivalent to, to get that functionality or what will be the 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 general 
Um, let's see if this would happen to be connected forms. Connected forms, that's the one. So, um, first of all, um, we're not going to pull it out of um, action form, the current product. So you have no danger of, of losing it. Uh, we're just not encouraging to use it. And then the statement says that we're that the new form builder is going to have corresponding features. So I haven't seen it yet. I can't talk to what we're going to do, but um, I, I would say you should you know watch the space, right? Okay. Uh, as as we get a look at the forms, the new forms builder, um, be be watching for how that uh, impacts you uh, and that functionality. Okay. So so Dale, if we have a, a lot of forms on our site, is there a migration path to convert those yeah. over? Yeah. the The plan is that it's going um, going to be largely, I don't know what the number is, 90% compatible, uh, that most things will port over. Uh, but you will have the option to, it, it's not going to be a one size fits all upgrade like we do with, with many things where it's just the new forms thing. Instead, you'll have a new forms engine that will sit as a, as a, as a new product that you'll be able to port to on a form by form basis and make, and test the result and take advantage of the new engine. Uh, in the meantime, the old one will continue to exist and, and not be taken away from you. So it should be a very stable uh, process once it's out uh, you, that you'll be under control of. That It's not just going to be, hey, we, we inflicted this thing on you and, and you're stuck with it. All right. And... <laughs> So unfortunately, I can't even tell you how easy or not it's going to be to move it from from one to the other. I haven't seen it at all yet. So, but I, I guarantee you, as I start to get a look at it, we'll be talking about it more in here. And Jim, I think you said you had multiple issues. Right. the The other question, um, Patrick and I had a an office hours session a couple of weeks ago, and we didn't come up with an answer. Um, and I was going to bring it to campfire but hadn't had a chance till today um, we have some editable grids and the request is to tie into when we edit the grid um, that when somebody makes an edit that we you know make a dirty type function so that they don't can't leave the page without saving or acknowledging that it's dirty um, and they they intentionally want to leave the page or to drive an auto save of some type. And in our discussion, Patrick and I didn't couldn't find a hook, so I was gonna open it to the larger trust of, of people here that have you know better ideas on how we might accomplish that. Did we um, also talk about it in a the subsequent campfire that that same week. I feel like maybe we did, but I don't know because I that we I was we were going to, and then I got called out of town, and I wasn't oh, okay. at that campfire, so I don't know if it actually got brought up. But I will go look at those campfires to see if. Yeah, I was just trying to remember. I I thought maybe we had, but I'm not certain about that. Um. And I don't see Ben or Mark on who are sort of the JavaScript <laughs> yeah, kind of gurus. So. I, I am thinking that JavaScript is going to be the thing to look at here. Yeah. I can, I, you know, sometimes there are sites that as you try to leave, it prompts you to do something before you leave. And I would think that since it's aware you're trying to leave, that would be the trigger that you would use to do your auto save. And so we talked we talked about that, and um, and uh, that's definitely possible. And, and uh, we we looked at ways to do that. But the the catch that 
that um that we couldn't find was that um so remind me um you have the you have the uh, grid it opens in edit mode right correct yeah and then uh, the 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 catch was determining whether or not any of the data had changed um and then basing the prompt to to uh, to save or to do an auto save on the fact that the data had changed. That was where we were getting caught up right. a little bit. Would you would it be acceptable to save regardless of whether there was a change or not? Possibly. Um, uh, I mean, as long as long I'd have to talk to the the client about it. You know, but. Well, I'm just thinking if that's the sticking point. Yeah. I wonder if it needs to be. Yeah. And and a, a follow up thought, although a little bit different train of thought, is that I I think that um, what I've noticed is other sites have um, monitored the location of the mouse, and as it approached the X, that would close the browser or or maybe the tab. Um, that's when it prompted you to do something. Yeah, we we were um, we we looked at uh, um, some possible JavaScript where it's based on viewport. Um, the the uh, so that if the um, if the user's cursor is leaving the viewport. But um, mm -hmm. Jim, I thought that you had said that that wasn't going to that didn't totally solve the. It it didn't. I mean, I mean and that may be what the best we can do. Um, um, but it's, yeah. That's why I want, if if you know, wanted to just bring bring it up for other ideas to go explore. So, um, so an alternate. Um, I mean, it's really not the question you're asking. Just thinking about alternate approaches. Uh, if you set a flag on the way into the page. And and unset the flag on save, then you your application could detect that there was some somebody navigated to a page and didn't click one of the exit buttons that you provided, uh, so you could route them back. But it, mm -hmm. it doesn't prevent them from leaving. Right. Well, and this app's been running for quite a while, and it, this is on you know. We're, um, so I don't know how often this is happening or if it just happened to the wrong executive at some point that, you know, that they complain that they lost their changes, but, uh, so. Okay. Well, I will, I will continue to look and if I find a working solution, I will let you know. Is this question? I'm sorry, Dale. Is the question that a person is leaving the possibly edited record or row in the action grid or the tab itself? So. Yeah, in the edited row in the action grid and then left or close the page or refresh the data um, without saving. Yeah, so yeah, I guess I would just do what, what Dale just said. I, I think if your page, if some JavaScript on your page were monitoring what was clicked on each time something was clicked on, then you could detect whether they had been in the row and then had jumped out of it. Okay. All right. Well, I won't take any more time with that. So Great. thank Too you guys. Good. Two good questions, several good first calls. Who else has a first call? Right, I'm going to move on, but there's always room to talk about other things. So come back to it if you if you if it occurs to you. Uh, just checking in with you on version 1.26. Uh, we released it more than a week ago. Uh, anybody install it? Anybody having any good time with it? I have installed it on, on one site. Uh, 
no issues with it, but I haven't done any development with it on that side either. We've just done the upgrade. I've also um, installed it on a site and um, I have been developing in that site heavily for I think five days, now, four days. And um, I can report that I have not had any trouble. Nice. It was a good Thank experience. You. And Mark, which version of DNN are you running now? Um, I have left that site on 10.2, 9.22, because I am unwilling to deal with the new um, site assets. If I were to upgrade higher than that. But that's the only reason that I haven't gone higher. Anybody else that upgraded um, dealing with a higher DNN version? Because I, I made the mistake of going with the site assets and now I'm stuck with them. I did the upgrade, um, um, but I haven't haven't used the site asset problem. You know, run into the issue, but yeah, done on other sites. I've upgraded DNN higher than ten two, but um, but not this site. Was there a question about the site assets or? No, it's specific. I, I just want to make sure that uh, Plan and App plays nicely with higher versions be, uh, beyond 11.2, 9.11.2, uh, which is what the docs say. Um, I would like to move up to the latest, or um, there's there's numerous fixes to the site assets in 9.13.3 um, that I'd like to take advantage of, but I don't want to uh, break Plan and App. So on that front, it remains in the category of, of uh, untested, but um, we have, n I have no reports of anybody with problems at 913. Um, it's just not tested. Our, um, our current version 1.27 is being tested against 1.27. We will, we should have, uh, I would expect that to be the version that uh, we recommend once 127 comes out and we are working to keep 127. I mean, it, it is a one objective. Um, there, there's one must have that's in 127. And as soon as we uh, achieve that, we're going to release it. Uh, so I'm very optimistic. It will be a short cycle release. That's cool. All right. Um, yeah, trying to just getting lost on my screen here. Has that ever happened to anybody? Um, so, last chance before I go on to other things that I've picked out. Um, Campfire contributions. Um, I took a look at this and um, we had an issue recently with a customer that tr was trying to install Plant an App. They uh, were not able to download. When you install Plant an App, the App Builder, for the first time on an on site install, and all this is not a problem if you're using our hosting because we just install everything automatically. But if you're doing an on-premise install, you install App Builder and then it downloads all the rest of the stuff. And uh, it, it wasn't downloading. Um, you, you, you install App Builder and then it, as soon as you place it on there, it was getting an error. Uh, place that uh, item on the page, it was getting an error. And um, so we were down to debugging, why isn't this connecting? Um, and so we ended up with a PowerShell script that said, just, just run this on your server independently and tell us if it downloads anything. And it didn't. And there's a couple of causes that can come into that. And we've updated our documentation to reflect it. Uh, one of the causes is that your server has to have the right, uh, have 
recent um, ciphers enabled for TLS 1.2. Um, and if, if, if it doesn't have any of those, then it'll, it, it won't download. It'll be a TLS error. And another is, um, surprisingly, you have to be connected to the internet in order to download files from the internet. And that turned out to be the problem in this case. And so uh, once once we got connectivity, then the files would download and, and uh, we were in good shape. Point is we came up with a nice little script that we're, where we can just in isolation test, uh, does, does download work? And so I'm gonna uh, add that to our um, campfire contributions. These, these for anyone who isn't familiar, lots of small techniques to do things. And so we're starting to put our support PowerShell scripts and things in here as well so that um, you can get them or we can refer you to them and say, hey, try this, see if this works. And so we put it in a publicly available place. So I'll be posting that, uh, but I haven't posted it yet. Um, and depending on if, you, if we get completely bored, I could, I could uh, post it in here while we're uh, as, as a live exercise, although I don't think that's going to add too much to our day. So I'm going to go on from that. So that's that's one you'll you'll see shortly, but I'll just remind you if you have something that just things that work in isolation that you want to share with the community, uh, we'd be real happy for you to share them. And for if anybody uh, who's on this call wants access uh, to the campfire site, so to be able to see uh, how things are built, and if you're not already, don't already have access, just send me a message here in the in the chat with your email address and I'll make sure you have access. And uh, the reminder is play nice, change your own stuff, contribute things, but leave other people's things alone. Uh, just, you can open them up to see how they're built, just don't change them. Any questions about the campfire.plantinapp.com? Cool. Um, so we haven't, I'm going to circle back to uh, Loco Development Playbook. We have uh, been talking about these, uh, haven't gotten to them recently, but this was uh, one of the suggestions that uh, the idea is that to improve the way that we all low code. Um, low code lets you do a lot of things very quickly, uh, but having good um, practices helps you um, uh, Helps things be more readable. Helps things helps keep you out of trouble. Things like that. So we have a uh, a low code suggestion which we haven't uh, expanded on yet. But the the idea is to put logic in workflows. And so the comments here uh, is that uh, it's possible to put big long lists of actions into other places like forms. You have a button on a form and you have a bunch of actions or into an automation, the automation runs and it does, uh, it has many, many actions uh, installed into it or APIs that can get called and the and the API has a lot of actions. So the, the uh, suggestion is that logic belongs in workflows. It makes it, uh, it, it separates it from where it gets consumed, but um, it's easily consumable. So, for example, if you think about it, if you uh, if you have an automation that does ten things, if you uh, if you put those ten things into a workflow, you can call a workflow from a uh, automation. So now the automation's job is just to wake up at the appropriate time and ask for something to get done from the workflow. Same way with an API, and and potentially it could be the same thing. Um, you, you, that same workflow that you used in the automation when, when that wakes up every hour could be connected to an API call so that if, if you want to allow some outside system to trigger the work. Um, and finally, you could have a button on a form that says you know, do the update. The thing that normally happens every hour could happen on demand on, as a result of a button. And so you've got your logic isolated into a place where logic belongs. So that's the that's the idea. Anybody with comments uh, for or against? A big four uh, on that. That's I have used that technique and it's saved. It, do we have 
any plans to be able to convert those long action lists of a form to a workflow? Is there anything? We've certainly Having talked plans about it. Executing them are, are different. <laughs> it is on a card someplace to to provide yeah. that functionality, but okay. a DevOps uh, in you know in development, but it's not hasn't gone anywhere. So, um, just to go, go ahead. Yeah, Joe, I was just going to ask Jim if you can. Uh, what what was the? Do you recall what benefit? you saw out of doing it that way oh well the big thing for me is i can trigger that same logic from multiple sources so i have an audit it's almost the description you get i have an automation job that runs when a file is dropped um, and gets triggered on a on a database load i also can users can manually trigger a process that does a recalculation um, and it's the same logic in one place. When I needed to adjust it, I don't have to find and worry that um, worry about the a change that I've made. I made in the in a form versus oh, I didn't make that change over in the automation or in an API call. Yeah, it's much easier and much more reliable just to have that logic in one place and just call the workflow. I have a question here uh, about yes. um, performance. Uh, actions in APIs uh, are same thing as in performance, uh, like uh, if we have them in uh, workflows and it's call the, the workflow from API. Yeah, it's the the actions are running the same action engine, and I would expect the performance would be the same. Um, when you call a workflow from some other place, then um, I would assume there's some small overhead that that comes with that call. Um, so. Uh, but but I th uh, I would expect it to be very small. Okay, it's uh, nice to know because I uh, have a large database uh, trying to pull out from uh, with API and uh, I will make in uh, a workflow to comp compile the the JSON object. The um, the other benefits that you get out of a workflow is that you have defined inputs and outputs. So uh, to me, it it um, becomes cleaner. If you're trying to do actions within a form, you might inadvertently be relying on some um, local context, some token uh, token or variable that is um, present in the form and um, when you when you put that into a workflow it, it, the workflow is only going to work if it has all the information nothing implicitly transfers you start with a blank slate when the workflow starts up you only get the inputs and you can only provide defined outputs so it I think it it adds a lot of clarity about what you're trying to accomplish Patrick yes, I you have well, more? I did, um, but first a comment on on just to further what we're saying right here is that uh, it also provides you a way to to isolate logic so that you can so that you can test logic separately from the from the bigger picture, and um, and that's good for troubleshooting. Um, so the other the earlier of the comment. Um, uh, I was, and it was really to just kind of uh, spark a conversation. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I was going to ask, how do people feel um, about uh, a, a single action? So, what if um, your your uh, business logic is simply creating a record in an entity? Um, you can add a create entity action into a um, into a uh, an action stack, but you could also create a workflow that runs that same action. And uh, um, and I know it sounds 
a little redundant, but I actually think there's an argument for the latter option. So what do you guys think? Well, I'll just state my argument. Yeah, since I would like said. to hear that argument. Sure. <laughs> um, because uh, there is the there's the potential that in the future there might be more that you want to do, other than just create that as as you uh, as you develop your application. Um, and if you have it in a workflow already, then you you have an easy way of of developing that logic without um, having to go to your uh, to your form. So I'm not saying it's always the right the, the right way to go, but it's a it's something to think about. Seems seems like if somebody worked on the sticky note with the conversion, it would you'd have the best of both worlds. <laughs> <laughs> so Patrick, if you had that workflow and presumably you would use that workflow in multiple um, places in your application. And then mm -hmm. you decided to modify or enhance your workflow. You then have to become aware and, and diligent and check all the places that you were using it, make sure that was compatible and, and useful. So, you know, I, I would, I'm wondering out loud, would it be better to not pick the workflow until you needed the enhancement? And then you'd know exactly where you were applying it in your application. I guess that's wondering out loud. Uh, um, I'm kind of, um, I, I think it's on a case by case basis for mm -hmm. me, right? That, um, uh, uh, and it always helps me to think about extremes. If you know that you're all, that you're going to create this thing in one place as a result of clicking a button, and it's it's uh, you know one thing. That's kind of the the low end case that says, yeah, just do it here. And then the other end of the spectrum is, you know that uh, you, your plans call for let's it, this this can ha this is going to happen in many places, and I'm going to want to uh, uh, you know I can anticipate in advance that yeah let's let's just make this be something that is callable so that. It's uniform. So those those are the extremes. So now you, it, the question becomes measuring as you're as you're or considering as you're going along uh, adding a form. Which which way does this lean? And uh, giving consideration to yeah, I'm going to want to add some logging in in at a later time, or a simple create of a of a record is going to I'm, I'm going to want to kick off a process every time that happens going forward. Uh, it, it's um, that that would be. I, I'm just saying that that's the argument for giving it thought. I I, I like the idea. I do find myself. I do find myself building more workflows that are calling workflows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's for that. What the reason that Mark describes, where it's like. Okay, I need this, this from this page. I need to call these three steps, and so I have common logic in one place, but I may have an over a workflow that calls two of the three steps, and someplace else that calls three of three steps, um, as opposed or you know guiding it through a parameter or something like that. But, Can we give some thought to things that uh, workflows either can or cannot do as compared to an action stack? Sure. Like, um, is it true that a workflow can't do a toast or a message? Correct. Okay, so that would just be a consideration. Of course, you could move those possibly before or after the call to the workflow. But... Mm -hmm. um, and you can make them, yeah. and you can make them uh, um, uh, conditional on output from the workflow, also. But right. yeah, they have okay. they have to be, but they have to be uh, called from the action stack on the front end. Okay. Um, good. Are, are there anything else that um, we could not do in a workflow if we were trying to convert an action stack to that?
well, again, it um, it's not going to be uh, aware of your um, your of your one hundred percent of your context. So, if you set a context variable before the um, call to the workflow, and then call the workflow, unless you pass that context variable it's it, it won't go so this um it, it, that's a that's a feature of workflow you don't get the full context you do get lots of the context you do get uh user and mm -hmm. page and module i think i mean there, there there's a lot of core things that you get but um context that you that you set in the in the um in the the life cycle of the form, those contexts does that is that sound right, Dale? Those would yeah. have to be passed by variables to the workflow, um, by inputs to the workflow. But uh, yes. other other context items that are not set in the life cycle of the form are available to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think it's worth a mention. Uh, sometime in the in the recent past, we deprecated a feature of automations that said, hey, you can trigger this automation by doing an API call. Uh, you, you can, you can, or an, rather an HTTP call. You can call this, uh, you can post this HTTP and this automation will run. Um, we determined that to be a security risk and, and removed it. And so now if you want to open up the possibility of triggering an automation or triggering some work on your system remotely, the right way to do it is through an API call, which can be secured by an API key or other security methods. So um, this is an argument for you want to run the same logic that is triggered by an automation, but you need to do it by way of an API. Having it be a workflow makes it where it's not duplicate. Mm -hmm. So this is a friendly place. It's a safe space. What's the argument against? Um, there's no, I don't have too many arguments against. Um, I like workflows tremendously. Uh, one thing that comes to mind, though, since you asked the question, is um, just the... Um, just simplicity or clarity if it's this, especially if you have a short action stack, it's not doing too much. Um, it's it's easy to see when you're developing the form, you've got your actions right there on the button or wherever you put them, and you don't need to go somewhere else in order to, uh, to understand what they're doing. So. Yep. It's not a um, strong argument, especially, you know, the, the, the counter arguments are pretty strong, like if reusability and so on. I definitely uh, hear that argument. Um, but, uh, and Dale, I think maybe in pre prep preparing to uh, share this with you, uh, it, um, but if you look at the, um, at our new, uh, um, uh, admin user interface in in uh, in configuration for the the new interface we have for uh, workflow uh, for uh, APIs and automations and workflows. Um, well, it doesn't actually it does make sense in workflows because you call other workflows. We have added the um, we've added links to the workflow um, and uh, once once we get that that uh, admin API into um, forms and grids, then uh, that's that's going to be kind of a game changer um, that you that you have that ability. Yep. So um, yeah, I don't understand adding the link to this, a workflow. But see this yeah. right here. Mm -hmm. This is executing some workflow that do something, but it has a hyperlink that if you click it, it opens the workflow in another window. So you can oh, to dig down it. easily into what it is. Unfortunately, it's not in our forms engine, so it's not a right. not a good argument for that. 
But if you, for example, if you were in an automation and you executed a workflow, uh, that's probably a better case yeah. example that we can drop in here. Um, so I'm just going to edit one here at random and add a action to call workflow. That if you were edit if in a workflow you'd be able to click this and go off and and work on that subordinate item leaving the automation open so it it removes that objection in all places except our forms engine which doesn't have it but we'll yeah and 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 uh, actions and listings as well and um, anyway anywhere you can call an action that's not um, in uh, in uh, workflows automation or APIs um, then we don't have this but. The idea is that we're gradually moving our our uh, our newer admin API to other places in the product. So that's that was my point. Is that um, is that I definitely hear what you're saying, Mark. That that is one drawback to this is that you have a bunch of logic that's not right there on the button that when you want to see it, and um, and uh, I know that giving you uh, stuff that's going to happen in the future isn't uh, helpful right now, but eventually. We, we're, we're headed in the direction that will make that easier. For the so case. I, yeah, I see the value of that. I also am watching what you're doing and it, what you're doing actually turns into like a, a visualizer as well. Like if I were looking at an action stack that I wasn't the one who created, um, I could click on that link and see a visual representation of what's going on. Um, that is that's the other power of uh, of workflows. Uh, yeah, an action mm -hmm. stack is very hard to process. Um, uh, but uh, and this goes back to actually one of the the plays that we just that we had a discussion um, in a previous campfire. We discussed the play about um, about uh, minimizing the 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 use of um, of uh, lots of actions in an execute actions loop uh, that you know, try to try to call a workflow. Um, instead and uh um, because workflows offer that visual um uh, look at what you're doing as well mm -hmm. yeah i like that aspect of it following the link and seeing the visual representation that's pretty strong It also ties into another <laughs> play that we talked about, and that was uh, um, not putting conditions on on actions in workflows, but trying to use as much as possible the um, the the gateways, uh, the the uh, the conditional gateways, because that way um, that provides that that pro provides more of that visual. Uh, um, interface so you can see where the logic is taking taking you. I still find those gateways to be a little bit um, confusing to get going correctly. I might just be me, but uh, it seems like I'm, I'm having trouble putting the conditions on and getting them to work right. So if uh, as a contra argument to what you just said, I find myself going ahead and putting conditions in the items inside a workflow, but I will type those conditions right in the description so that I can see that mm -hmm. at a glance. Sure. Um, have you seen the 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 new way of uh, doing conditions on the gateways? Show me now. You're on the spot, Dale. <laughs> I also put all the names of, if I'm going to create um, tokens in my action, I'll also put the names of the token right there in the description. I actually found that to be very useful. I I do that by prefacing, you know, the, the, all the tokens for a particular one with a, you know, a code, like these are my, you know, my inventory record, you know, tokens are are set mm -hmm. here type thing. Okay. So what Dale's showing right now is that 
is that um, we used to just give you like you double clicked to set your condition and all you had was that space right there to, to type in. Now you have a pop up um, and uh, you can you can label create a label for your condition and uh, and and you have a, a, a nicer um, uh, area to actually put in the uh, the logic. Does that pop up come up when you go edit it also? So yeah, see Dale just uh, double clicked. No, I don't think I've actually been using this, so this is good to see. So this is in one twenty six, right? Oh, we don't. This is not. Yes, in, and yeah. it's only yeah. going to be in the new view, I think. Yeah. So you can just double click that and change. The, um. Uh, it's it's interesting that this hover is um, hmm. controlled. Yeah. Yeah, and I've also never liked the fact that you can't really change the size of those boxes either. Yeah, I've tried a hundred times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so just to um, finish out for anybody who's watching after the fact, we would need an end gateway that um, we connect everything up to so that we do a split one way or the other, and then we do things, and then we come out and merge them back together again. Um, well, while you're there, is, yeah. is there a way to rename that merge and split to put something? Looks like it. And yeah, if we add a workflow in here, uh, I wanted to show off that, uh, I mean, back to focusing on, on workflows for a minute. So we've got, um, on calling workflows, again, part of the, the value for workflows calling workflows is that uh, you can quickly click off to go and investigate that. We were talking about that. Uh, if you provide descriptions in your inputs, and and we have the ability to do that on the outputs as well, then when you're editing here, when, I mean, we're calling this workflow, and on the inputs, it, that description shows up here. So now you have the ability to get a peek into why you're passing this thing or what you're expecting back. Uh, it pops up as this i icon if mm -hmm. if you've used it um so let's see just for fun i'm going to call this the keep this around but i want to uh, save it because uh, we have the old view versus the new view um, Patrick, just today I'm noticing that this save is not happening as fast as it, as it, it was lightning fast there for, for a couple of versions and I'm not, hmm. it's, it's a little bit slower again. Anyway, going back to the old view, uh, you, you get this, it go it goes back to showing you the condition versus the, um, the tag. Uh, so, uh, and let's see when we execute a test. Um, we're not seeing a way to navigate to this thing. So those things are exclusive to the, to the new view. So just so, part of what you get with the new view. Good. When did the old view and new view capability appear? It was sometime in 125. This has been around for a while, but um, uh, much like we did with APIs, we provided a new view, but we didn't want to take away something uh, mm -hmm. in, in case we we discovered problems. So um, this, I wouldn't say it's experimental, but it's um, you know it, it's new, and you you could experience something with it, and we'd love to hear about it. If you do, we'll fix it, but. Um, we didn't. We didn't want to impact your ability to edit production. So yeah, it happened 
sometime in the last few months. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so we got through a play today, so that was good. So thanks for, for uh, investing in that with us. We've hit our hour. Uh, if there's any last minute questions, I'll take them. And if not, we will adjourn into Afterglow. I do appreciate your spending the hour with us. We get better because you show up. And uh, we will do this again next week and then take a one week off. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you, uh, see you next week.